Hi, I'm David Bergman. I'm a green architect and eco-designer and the author of a new book, Sustainable Design, The Critical Guide. And I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about what we cover in the book and who it's for as well. Uh, but first, I actually want to talk about what's not in the book, in that we don't stress, we don't spend a lot of time talking about the ecological issues and crises or the doom and gloom stories. We don't talk about why we have to do these things for environmental reasons. What I do try to, try to stress is why we want to do these various environmental uh, techniques and steps and, and approaches for the good of all of us, of, of humanity as well as of the planet, uh, you know, and because it's really inseparable. So we approach sustainable design from the viewpoint of what and who it is we're trying to sustain. You know, we're not really all that worried about sustaining the planet. It's going to live you know, just fine without us. But we need, we need the environment, the ecosystem, to sustain our lives. So really, that's all intertwined. And the kind of approach I want to take is looking at what I call the win-win, or often the win-win-win solutions, in which we are achieving things that are not only good for the environment, uh, but good for us in terms of our daily lives, and good for us in terms of our species, our flourishing as a species. Too often, sustainable design is seen as requiring sacrifices, changes to the ways we live, to the comforts of our buildings, uh, even to the quality of design. I maintain that's a false choice, a false dilemma, that we can, in fact, and do incorporate sustainable design without sacrificing. Um, and I, I talk about that topic a bunch more, by the way, in my blog, ecooptimism.com, where we look at these win-win-win situations. We start by asking what exactly is sustainable design, because it can mean different things to different people. It can mean anything from simply using recycled materials to incorporating techniques to lessen environmental impact to addressing social inequity. In the opening chapter, Eco Design What and Why, I talk about the evolution of how we think of sustainability and sustainable design. That we started from the mantras of the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle, and moved on from there to look at the life cycle of our buildings and our products. We look at some, what we call cradle to grave and then expand it to cradle to cradle design, that entire life cycle. And then we expand it further again to incorporate social issues in the form of the triple bottom line. And then we have what some of us think of as the final, the ultimate goal of sustainable design, something we call regenerative design. And that involves going beyond doing less bad and uh, beyond even keeping the environment on an even keel and going to repairing some of the damage that we've already done to the environment. That's the regenerative aspect of it. Now there's some jargon in those terms and in general I've tried to avoid the use of jargon in the book. I, didn't, I wanted to put in language that was easily accessible so that the book is intended not just for professional designers but for anyone, for you know, lay, lay audience who are interested in sustainable design and how it affects the places they live and work in. Sustainable design is a massive topic, and this is a relatively small book. We don't attempt to cover every possible topic in sustainable design. It's not an exhaustive how-to manual. The subtitle of the book, it's called A Critical Guide, and that's to illustrate the approach I'm taking here, which is to lay out fundamentals and ways of looking at the sustainable design. The book is organized topically into chapters starting with, from the beginning point of many designs, starting with site issues. Um, and from there, we progress to look at water efficiency, and then we move into uh, energy efficiency. And I actually break that into two chapters, one on passive solar design and another on active energy techniques. Uh, from there, there's a chapter on indoor environmental quality, looking at both the quality of the air and the other aspects of the life inside our buildings. I have a chapter on materials, um, and then a chapter following that on eco-labels and building rating systems, where we look at how we can evaluate some of the information that these labels and programs give us. In each of these chapters, I attempt to outline some of the general principles and to analyze a few of the solutions that, that we can apply there. In the concluding chapter of the book, The Future of Sustainable Design, I talk about the evolution of sustainable design's role within the design world in general. And I refer to a period in the early mid 20th century uh, and before we had really realized that we had to deal with some of these environmental issues and we practiced what I call at that point design as usual. 
Then as we began to realize that, yeah, there were some environmental issues and there were some ways we could approach it, we began to see the beginnings of green design. And I call that era green design as unusual because the buildings that resulted usually didn't look like what we thought of as typical buildings. As our awareness of environmental issues and environmental solutions has expanded, I think we've now entered a phase that we might call green design as usual instead of unusual, in that we're seeing it incorporated into more and more buildings and it's becoming less unusual to stumble upon green architecture. In terms of the future, where I think we're going is actually a return to the idea of design as usual. And by that I mean that we won't even think of sustainable or green design as a separate or added on part of design. It'll just be integrated completely and without question into everything we design.